you know, if uh, something has a catchy label or its own acronym, it must be important. The nuns, the duns, and the NRBSs have garnered attention because of the release of the most recent Pew Research report titled America's Changing Religious Landscape, conducted in late 2014 and published in early May of this year. This survey of 35,000 Americans mirrors the 2007 survey also conducted by Pew Research. The findings seven years apart provide clear trends and have caused both concern and interest in the results. The subtitle of the published report is Christians Decline Sharply as Share of Population, Unaffiliated and Other Faiths Continue to Grow. These unaffiliateds, or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not the <laughs> N-U-N-S's, may signal a threat to traditional Christian denominations, but they provide a particularly unique opportunity for Unitarian Universalists. The United States is still home to more Christians than any other country, with seven in ten identifying with some branch of the Christian faith. However, that re represents a drop from 78.4% who describe themselves as Christians to 70.6% a drop of almost eight percentage points in seven years. During the same time, those identifying themselves as religiously unaffiliated, the nuns, have increased more than six points, from 16.1% to 22.8%. Within the nuns are several subgroups, including atheists, agnostics, or nothing in particular. <laughs> Some nuns further define themselves as the duns, those that are not just unaffiliated, but done-affiliated. These people have been there, done that in an organized religion tradition, and for whatever reason are now done with it. According to Neil Carter in his article, The Nuns Versus the Duns, these duns are not just unaffiliated, they are anti-affiliated. Carter represents a particular demographic within the, the nuns, those that have suffered discrimination because they either professed or were outed as atheists. Neil Carter was a middle school history teacher in Jackson, Mississippi, who lost his job after students ferreted out information from a like on his Facebook page to a link about atheism. He had never discussed religion or his beliefs in class, but he was called in and warned never to do so. The next year he was transferred to another school as a math teacher, what harm could they do? <laughs> and dismissed one year later with no direct mention of atheism. But Carter told Mo Rocca on a CBS Sunday morning interview that he knew why he was dismissed. Since then, Neil Carter has also been divorced after he told his wife that he was an atheist. She said she felt like she did not know who he was, that the man she had married had died. He now has a blog, Godless and Dixie, and has joined a group called Openly Secular. <coughs> <coughs> Among all the groups that are disenfranchised or who suffer discrimination, we may not even think about the consequences of being atheist. But there is actually a label for anti-atheist, uh, what is atheophobia. <laughs> According to the American Humanist Association, atheists face discrimination socially and legally. They cite the following instances. Seven states still have enforceable laws on the books that prohibit atheists from holding office. Thirteen countries have laws that revoke citizenship for, deny marriage of, and even kill atheists. Among Americans, 53% are least likely to vote for an atheist for president, favoring a candidate who hmm, has smoked pot, <laughs> never held office, or had an extramarital affair. After all, when is the last time you heard a major political speech that did not end with, may God bless America? 65% of Americans would hire an atheist over a religious person for a job waiting tables, but only 33% would hire an atheist to work in a daycare center. I've never labeled myself either an atheist or an agnostic, yet I don't believe in any sort of paternalistic God sitting in a heaven meeting out rewards and punishments and interceding in human affairs. In the past year, my family has endured several life-threatening and even life-ending situations. And I have been asked if I am an atheist, do I believe in heaven, and what do Unitarian Universalists believe? <laughs> I find it difficult to un articulate my unbelief as others are struggling to confront their own or someone else's mortality. I may be at peace with it, but they clearly are not. 
and the waiting room outside the adult intensive care unit is not an appropriate setting to launch into the UU version of Do Re Mi. <laughs> I could offer to print off all the sermons I've written over the past 24 years for this congregation, but that would send them running back to the nearest prayer circle for sure. <laughs> so I do the best to explain that belief in a traditional religion is not a requirement for living a life of purpose and service and even spiritual discipline. But the nuns and the duns are not only atheists and agnostics. In fact, they only make up a combined 7% of the 22.8% of unaffiliateds, with the nothing in particular designation owning almost 15% of the total. The report also has an interactive database tool that allows you to delve into more detail by various demographics, by age, gender, racial and ethnic composition, income, education, and marital status. In short, it is a treasure trove of information about a growing population of those unaffiliated who in some instances categorize themselves as NRBS, not religious, but spiritual. Those who say that even though they are unaffiliated, religion is very important or somewhat important. A simple search on Amazon turns up book after book on how to tap into the number of growing unaffiliated. Titles like The Rise of the Nuns, Understanding and Reaching the Religiously Unaffiliated, or Why Nobody Wants to Go to Church Anymore, or Understanding Today's Unchurched and How to Connect with Them, and many, many more. And these were all published before the most recent release of the Pew Research Report. The current summer 2015 issue of UU World also deals with the opportunities presented by the growing nuns, nuns demographic. President of the UUA, Peter Morales, urges UU congregations to embrace failure in his opening editorial. He realizes that to meet the challenges of the changing shape of religion in America, we need to move out of our comfort zone, knowing that some initiatives will fail, but that we can learn valuable lessons from those failures and avoid the stagnation of doing only what we have always done, obviously not effective with the nuns and duns. Morales writes that we can choose to think about the changes in religion today, and these are his words, as an enormous pro problem. Another way to think of our situation is that there is a huge spiritual hunger and that millions upon millions of unaffiliated people constitute what he calls a breathtaking opportunity. He exhorts us to hear and feel what spiritual hunger the religiously homo homeless people around us feel. Ask them, he says, what is missing? If normal congregational life is not feeding them, what will? Empathy, compassion, openness, humility, but then what? Are we perceived too church-like for the duns? Or are we perceived as not spiritually disciplined enough for the nuns who are seeking spiritual richness? <coughs> But being responsive to what the nuns are searching for doesn't mean abandoning the core principles and values that make Unitarian Universalism the rich spiritual community that it is. In fact, the Barna Group, a Christian think tank, found that most millennials don't look for a church facility that caters to the whims of pop culture. They want a community that calls them to deeper meaning. We could probably learn a great deal from the detailed research that many more traditional religions have already invested in tapping the unaffiliated. The summer issue of UU World devotes several other articles to ways of adapting and growing spiritual practice and community. These initiatives range from decreasing the number of services to two repeated services each month to better use human resources, or to providing quality bikes at affordable prices for members who have difficulty getting transportation, or to developing new learning options when a congregation calls for more intense, in-depth experiences. In another article, Elaine McCardle celebrates the success of congregations that have explored streaming worship through online broadcasts. The challenges are the initial cost for equipment, servers, and even copyright permission for music used in the service, not to ignore the need for technical expertise. The rewards, however, are great. Congregations using online streaming have garnered participants from around the world. They have developed rituals for those who are not physically present to participate by lighting a chalice or donating online during the service. Some have found online broadcasts as a way to connect with congregants who travel for several weeks or months each year, or who cannot attend due to health or weather conditions. All Souls Congregation in Tulsa, Oklahoma has more than doubled its reach through live streaming and its video archive on YouTube. Who knew that there were more than kittens playing pianos? <laughs> <laughs> 
The online streaming also provides a way for those who are tentative about their affiliation with a UU church. Due to misunderstandings or bias by families or employers, virtual attendees can worship without fear of any unintended consequences. And gay or lesbian couples who have not come out to family or friends could attend virtually. I'm not suggesting that any of these ideas are initiatives that we should try. And we're all familiar with how reticent most UU, UUs are to engage in anything that resembles what we associate with evangelism. Until I was 12, I was raised as an EUB, Evangelical United Brethren. It's right there in the name. <laughs> I vividly remember a woman evangelist named Sadie who arrived dressed all in white with her accordion and her blind pianist Clifford. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Each of her services would end with an altar call. I was pretty spellbound as a kid by the sight of so many people I knew crowding the center aisle to go accept Jesus as their personal savior as she played and we all sang, just as I am. Clearly the need for community and a transformative experience is powerful, but I am, I suppose, something of an evangelical refugee. So what can we do with this recognition of what Peter Morales tells us we can see as a breathtaking opportunity? When I did a search on UU evangelism, the consensus across many articles and sermons was that focusing on growth for growth's sake alone really doesn't work very well. The UUA website features an article titled Evangelism, Letting Our Love Out. The guidance of the UUA is that evangelism is not a membership program, a set of activities, or even a set of skills. Evangelism has very little to do with deciding to grow. At its core, Evangelism is the natural outgrowth of our sense of religious community. That is why deciding to grow, ironically, has little to do with growth. This is why churches that grow often have no particular membership program. What growing churches do have is a sense in their mission and an enthusiasm that is palpable and contagious. Yet, in spite of this advice, there is a link at the bottom of the page to access resources for growing your congregational membership with 24 additional pages of links and articles. But our evangelism has nothing to do with converting someone to a particular creed, since we affirm the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. It has nothing to do with competing with other religions. It has nothing to do with saving someone's soul, at least not in the traditional religious sense. But what UU evangelism can do is to provide a community based on ethical and spiritual core values. That's why we as Unitarian Universalists are uniquely poised to provide a kind of spiritual salvation for those unaffiliated who long for the haven of a community. A few months ago I spoke about emotional contagion and the power of numbers to accomplish what we can only call good works. The article that first attracted my attention to this potential of the unaffiliated appeared in an editorial in the Daily Item on May 20th. Albert Hunt, a columnist for Bloomberg, titles his editorial with a question, non-religious reshaping U.S. politics? Question mark? <laughs> Hunt cites the Pew Research Report and quotes several political analysts who see untapped potential among the young millennials who make up the majority of the unaffiliated. David Campbell, a political scientist at the University of Notre Dame, suggests that the nuns are becoming more active and are galvanized by the religious right and their stance on social issues such as gay rights. On the other hand, conservative political leaders feel that the sheer number of unaffiliated will energize their evangelical base on issues like same-sex marriage or the supposed war on Christmas. Hunt states that the religious right doubts I think this is really interesting, doubts that the unaffiliated can coalesce behind any agenda. Timothy Head, executive director of the Conservative Faith and Freedom Coalition, believes secular voters are simply harder to organize because unbelief historically is not as animating in terms of political engagement as deeply held religious faith. Wouldn't it be great to prove him wrong <laughs> by creating a juggernaut for peace, compassion, respect, and tolerance? This congregation is growing as noted in the most recent Phoenix. This congregation is more visible in the community than it has ever been before, whether with the Love Flows projects, efforts by members such as the Passy Sisters who got press time for collecting pill bottles with their friends from Malawi, whether it's Anne's letter to the editor in response to the Obama hate letter, or the sense of community displayed in our members in what will be the 23rd yard sale. <laughs> we are beginning to broadcast what would be missing in our community if this congregation did not exist. 
The word evangelism comes from the Greek meaning good news. And I know each of us here t today believes we have good news. The challenge is how to spread the good news in ways that are consistent with our core beliefs. I know I can do a better job. I sometimes feel like I am the punchline to that old joke. What do you get when you cross a UU you with a Jehovah's Witness? Someone who walks up your steps, knocks on your door, and doesn't know what to say. <laughs> The UUA web article, A Liberal View of Evangelism, ends with this. When each of us can answer why we are Unitarian Universalists and why being a member of our church is important and what we love about our congregation, then we are on our way to being evangelists. We can't help it. Good news wants and needs to be shared. And we can't share our good news until we know what it is.